Jesus said in the Gospel, If anyone loves me, my Father will love that person, and we will come to him and make our home within him. That's how intimate God wants to be to us. He loves us so much. And so living in a cloister, living in a monastery, is simply living with God. I think women enter our community in a search for an intimate communion of life with God. They want to devote their whole life to the pursuit of God. And it's not a cheap grace. Passionless life is about love. It's a love that expresses itself in sacrificial living. The passionists are unique in that we make a, a special vow to promote devotion to the passion of Christ. And so for us, we fulfill that vow through our contemplative life, first of all by prayer, and also by other ways that are compatible with our contemplative vocation. For instance, through the Passionist Oblates, who share our spirituality of loving and honoring Jesus in the great mystery of his love. A monastery is God's house, God's holy dwelling place. These 170 acres of land are God's property, where he invites us to live with him in an intimate communion of love. St. Paul of the Cross, even in the primitive rule, allowed for retreatants inside the monastery. We are so grateful to God that we have been able to build a retreat house. So we have this wonderful area of silence and solitude where people can come and enter into an encounter with God. We're always seeking ways to bring others to know and to love our Lord in His passion, death, and resurrection. That is really what distinguishes us as a unique religious community in the church. It is that vow uh, that gives unity to everything in our life, that vow to promote devotion to the passion of Christ. I grew up in a rural area, and I went to Catholic grade school until um, seventh grade. I transferred to a public junior, senior high school. You know, a very normal upbringing um, involved in sports and Girl Scouts and all those types of things. I was just a regular teenager. I had a boyfriend, and during my senior year, I was football homecoming queen and prom queen, and I was very popular. But yet, there was an emptiness there. I began to realize that I was going to have to make a decision, that I had to make a choice, and that the choice I made would affect the rest of my life. And was I going to choose the way of the world, the wide and easy road, or was I going to leave all that behind and follow Christ? And so I started coming to spiritual direction here at the monastery. I had no thought of becoming a Passionist nun. It just didn't dawn on me that I could ever be a cloistered nun. I just thought, it's beyond me, you know, <laughs> I couldn't do that. And sister invited me to come for a live-in inside the monastery. And when I came in, I just felt so much at peace, so much peace, I felt so much at home. I've been in the monastery now for 11 years, and I wouldn't trade them for anything in the world. As contemplatives, we're called to seek the face of the Lord continually in prayer. And so the first thing we do in the morning is spend a lot of time alone with God in prayer. 
And then we gather together in chapel to sing morning prayer, which is part of the Liturgy of the Hours. The Liturgy of the Hours is a set cycle of prayer designed to sanctify the whole course of the day and night. We pray at morning prayer, at mid-morning, midday, mid-afternoon, at dusk and early evening, and again at night prayer before retiring to bed. It is a prayer of praise and worship and thanksgiving to God, as well as a prayer of pleading and intercession for all of God's people and indeed for the whole world. And so it is a very important part of our life and it, it establishes the rhythm of our life. The Eucharist is the living memorial of the passion and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the high point of our whole day. As scripture tells us, on the cross, Jesus offered himself as a living sacrifice to the Father out of love for us and for our salvation. And so, when we receive him in Holy Communion, or when we pray before the Eucharist, before the Blessed Sacrament, that attitude of a total self-sacrificing love passes into us and forms a Eucharistic attitude in us that enables us to literally lay down our lives in a life of prayer, a life of sacrifice for the church. And so it is through Jesus, with Jesus, and in Jesus that we can joyfully give ourselves day in and day out to the Father. Even though we are called uh, as contemplatives to a life of prayer, that does not mean that we're on our knees all day long. The liturgy, all that we have celebrated in the Mass, uh, we try to live out in what I like to call an interior liturgy of the heart, where we are giving ourselves joyously to the Father with Jesus in all the types of work required in a monastery. On ordinary work days, we have about five hours for work. When we come to religious life, we lay ourselves before the Lord and say, here I am, Lord. I'm yours. Do with me what you will. Use me for your people, for your church. And he does, and, and it's amazing. So we have sisters with background in business administration. So they are doing the bookkeeping of the community. One sister is managing the website. Another sister is retreat house administrator. We have sisters with a medical background, so they have been able to put those gifts to the service of the community in the infirmary in the care of the sick and the aging religious. We have uh, sisters with writing skills. We have sisters with artistic ability and musical talent. But even if a, a person doesn't think she has any talent, doesn't have any skills, that should never hold her back because whatever we are asked to do under holy obedience, we find out we can do it and we didn't know that we would be able to do it.
went to college, and then after graduating, I began a career in business. I was doing quite well. I was pretty happy. And while I was working, I decided to go back to college and to receive my master's degree. Now my career was doing really well. And it seemed that the more I accomplished and the more successful I became, the more empty I was feeling inside. One day, while I was at a corporate meeting, out of the blue, one of the executive managers said to me, are you going to be a nun? I was stunned. <laughs> Before I could say anything, the meeting began, but I was thinking to myself, this is the most unexpected question from the most unexpected person, certainly at the most unexpected time. This had to be a grace moment. And I felt that it was almost the Lord saying himself, are you going to be a nun? Now is the time. So I took it to prayer. And after a time of um, discernment with my spiritual director, I visited a number of monasteries and communities, and here I am. I made the big step. I answered the call of God, and it was truly, a, it was a big decision. There was an awful lot uh, that I had to give up, but God was calling and I knew he was calling. And so I left and I came to the Passionists. I found them on the website <laughs> and it was wonderful. All I can say is that with all that I had received in the business world, I have no comparison to what I feel here and the joy that I feel. The love of God has just so filled that emptiness within and I have never been happier in my life. What a wonderful gift a, a vocation is, and I thank God dearly for it. Passionist nuns are called to a life of prayer and silence and solitude, but we are not hermits. <laughs> we foster a real family spirit in the community, and in fact, we look for sociability in a candidate. You know, uh, uh, we live so closely together that a person has to be able to get along well with others. So that is something we really value and try to cultivate. And, and all of our sisters try to make this a happy place. The joy that we have comes from the Lord. It's a spiritual joy. And it overflows in, in effervescent companionship with our sisters at recreation. And after lunch, we have a brief period of recreation. And uh, then we have a period, a block of time that is free time, where a sister can go outside and explore in the woods. She can do whatever she wants. <laughs> And then we have that long period of recreation in the evening. On ordinary days, you know, a good game of aggravation can sometimes raise the decibel level to unbelievable, you know, intensity in our recreation room. On very special days, we will do humorous skits. And they are usually so funny that people are bent over with laughter. We try to make community life joyful. <laughs> when I entered the community, I was motivated by a, a strong call from the Lord. I came out of love for the Lord Jesus Christ and a desire to honor and love Him in His sacred passion. But I was also looking for happiness, very much so. I was a musician. I had studied uh, music for 10 years intensely. I was offered a scholarship to the uh, University of Louisville School of Music. But at that time, the call was so strong in my heart to enter the Passionist community. And so when I entered the Passionist community, 
it never occurred to me I would ever use my music. God is a God of surprises. Right after my first profession, I was named choir directress and organist, and I have been using my music ever since. When I look back, I, I'm amazed. It was all grace. I wonder now how I did it. So young. I was not quite 18 years old. We're made for happiness. We're not made for suffering. Passionists are not about suffering. Passionists are about love. So I would have to say, after having lived many decades as a passionist nun, it has been a love story. founder, St. Paul of the Cross, is probably most known for his devotion to the Passion. The Passionists take a foul to spread devotion to the Passion, and he insisted on that. He also insisted that we be masters of prayer and teach people how to meditate, how to think on the passion, how to pray on it, how to let that grow and grow and grow as being the center, the motive, the, the driving power in a Christian life. There's a writer who said that Paul of the Cross could equally be called Paul of the Trinity because he was always writing to people about what St. Paul the Apostle told the Corinthians, that did you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells within you? And so this truth of the divine indwelling in a baptized soul is right at the heart of our passionist charism. And indeed, it is a precious fruit of why Jesus died on the cross. Jesus died to give us life. And that life is eternity begun. It's a, sh a sharing in the very life of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As Passionist nuns, we make five vows. The purpose of the vows is to free us to love Christ with an undivided heart. The first vow is to promote devotion to and a grateful remembrance of His sacred passion. Our next three vows are the evangelical counsels, chastity, poverty, and obedience. Almost all religious throughout the world make these vows. In the profession of our vows, what we give up are true values, marriage, family life, the right to own personal possessions, and the full use of our free will. Those are true goods, true values. So when God asks us to offer those up as a sacrifice, He only asks us to sacrifice a good for a greater good. With the vow of chastity, I renounced marriage and all the goods of that vocation, being a spouse to a man bearing children, only for the sake of having an undivided heart for Jesus Christ and being a mother to souls. In the vow of poverty, we make this vow because we want to leave all things behind for the sake of Christ. Giving up, having personal possessions, and being united with Christ in His self-emptying, I bring the riches of Christ to the world in a mysterious way. With the vow of obedience, we are offering our wills to Christ that they may become aligned with His will. Our fifth vow is enclosure. The purpose of enclosure is to protect our life of prayer. It's like a safeguard because it helps to keep out distractions. Not so much to keep us in, as some people might think, but to keep distractions out. So enclosure is to promote solitude and silence for the sake of union with the Beloved, of keeping our hearts and, and our minds fixed on Him.
Our whole passionist spirit is well summed up in the habit we wear and cherish very dearly and our passionist emblem. But there's a tradition in the passionist congregation that it was the mother of Jesus herself, the mother of sorrows, who came to St. Paul of the Cross and showed him the passionist habit. To be clothed in black is like being clothed in all the love that was in the heart of Jesus on the cross. It keeps you very aware that you and all the sisters in the community are consecrated to God. We are in the world, but not of the world. And secondly, the very practical advantage is that when you get up in the morning, you don't have to think about what you're going to wear that day. And so for any young woman who is tired of being ruled by the fads and fashions of the day, wearing a religious habit can be a wonderfully joyful and liberating experience. The Passionist emblem consists of a white heart and there's a cross mounted above the heart. And inside the heart is written, Jesu Christi Passio, which in English is the passion of Jesus Christ. St. Luke tells us that Mary, the mother of Jesus, treasured and pondered in her heart all the words and deeds of Jesus. That is what we are called to do, is to ponder the story of his love to the point where it engraves itself indelibly into our hearts and our memories and becomes a living memory of the passion of Jesus. I like to call it the background music of our life. We also wear on our passionist habit a rosary which is a sign and symbol of our devotion to and our love for the Blessed Virgin Mary. For us passionists, Mary is mother, she is teacher, model, and guide. She was a woman of courage and of faith. Her yes to God changed the whole history of the world. I think women who enter here today are motivated by a desire to bring mercy to the world through a life of prayer and sacrifice and to be continually pleading for mercy, a mercy that transforms hearts. It is like entering into the heart of the church where you share the suffering and sorrow, the crosses that people are bearing today. And I think that is one reason why people instinctively know that we will take their burdens, their sorrows, their sufferings, their concerns into our hearts and we will carry them before God in prayer. A religious vocation is not a career. To enter a monastery is not to pursue a career. So therefore, one does not need to have a master's degree in theology. One does not need to be a saint. One only needs a teachable heart. And I think that is very important. Religious formation is not about academics. It's about the transformation of the human person minds and hearts and wills. It's about becoming more and more a person who thinks with the church and moves and feels with the church. The grace of a religious vocation is very powerful. It contains divine power. And this divine power is released into operation when we say yes.
Is this an easy life? No, it is demanding. But you know, when Christ in the gospel, he asks us, come and follow me. And we're like, oh yes, Lord, I wanna follow you. And then he says, well, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. We're like, oh, you know, I don't know if I wanna do that. Pope John Paul II said that all the baptized, but especially those consecrated men and women, that we have a special share in our Savior's cross. In fact, he said that religious life is an invitation to be that grain of wheat that falls to the ground and dies. Why? For the sake of death? No, for the sake of life, for eternal life, for so many souls. Christ is looking for spouses who will be his helpmates, for women who are heroic, who are courageous, who are strong, not in a worldly way, like in a tough way, but in a way that is virtuous. Christ is looking for women who will lay down their lives for him.